Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to our panel discussion on environmental justice presented by the Heckscher Museum of Art. Um, the museum is proud to present this program in conjunction with the exhibition Richard Mayhew Reinventing a Landscape, um, which is on view at the museum through April 24. Thank you for joining us tonight and for your enthusiasm and support for the museum. We really appreciate it. I'm Caitlin Sher, Development Manager, and I'm pleased to welcome you here tonight. Joining me momentarily on screen will be our three panelists, Mark Chambers, Dr. Mark Chambers, who you see right there, Jeremy Dennis, and Justice Bennett. Dr. Mark Chambers is a professor in the Africana Studies Department at Stony Brook University, where he also teaches in the History Department. His interests include environmental and technological contacts between Indigenous peoples and free and enslaved miners in North America. His recent book, Gray Gold, Lead Mining and Its Impact on the Natural and Cultural Environment, 1720 to 1840, is a cultural history of lead mining in the region that became the state of Missouri. Dr. Chambers is a Rita Allen Civic Science Fellow. Jeremy Dennis is a fine art photographer and tribal member of the Shinnecock Indian Nation. His photography explores indigenous identity, cultural assimilation, and the ancestral traditional practices of the Shinnecock Indian Nation. His work is included in the collections of the Heckscher Museum of Art, the Hudson River Museum, the New York State Museum, and others. Justice Bennett is the curatorial assistant at the Heckscher Museum of Art. She completed her master's degree at the Winterthur Program for American Material Culture at the University of Delaware. She is interested in Black feminist art history and wrote her master's thesis on the landscape and historical preservation efforts on St. Croix, United States Virgin Islands. At the end of the presentation, the panelists will be responding to some of your questions, so please feel free to type them into the Q&A box or chat box at any time. Without any further ado, I'll now hand the program over to Justice, who will give you all a brief background on information regarding the topic of environmental justice. Great, thank you so much, Caitlin. Um, let me cue this up. And here we go. Hi, everyone. Like Caitlin said, my name is Justice Bennett, the curatorial assistant here at the Heckscher Museum of Art. And I wanna thank everyone so much for coming out. It means a lot. So before we begin our discussions today, I would like to start today's programming with a land acknowledgement. The purpose of this statement is to respect and affirm the ongoing relationship between indigenous people and the land. In Australia and Canada and among tribal nations in the United States, it is commonplace to open events and gatherings by acknowledging the traditional indigenous inhabitants of the land. Many institutions are adopting this practice. Acknowledgement by itself is a small gesture that can be an opening to greater public awareness. The Heckscher Museum of Art is situated on the traditional territory of the Matinecock Tribal Nation, whose presence continues in New York today. We acknowledge the meaning and the sacredness of the land for the Matinecock and its sister tribes on Long Island. We recognize histories of land theft, violence, and erasure, as well as the continued disenfranchisement and displacements of Indigenous peoples. Before turning over the program to Dr. Mark Chambers and Jeremy Dennis, I would like to provide a very brief introduction to this evening's topic. Artists have always been concerned with the environment. Our current exhibition, Richard Mayhew Reinventing Landscape, celebrates artist Richard Mayhew. Mayhew is a Long Island-born artist who was raised in Amityville on the Shell Shore in the 1920s and 30s. He is Native American and African American, and these identities have shaped how he sees the world and how he paints. Mayhew says of his heritage, the two cultures overlap in terms of the land being important to them. The American landscape can look very different depending on your racial identity. For example, when Mayhew visits plantation sites that others may see as beautiful, he focuses instead on the overlooked shadowy spaces that symbolize the violence of slavery. When speaking about his ancestors, he has said, their blood is in the soil of the United States. 
Mayhew very rarely represents people in his abstracted landscapes because viewers are invited to bring their own experiences to what they perceive, thereby becoming the figure in the painting. Standing before his colorful atmospheric works, you do not feel like you're looking out over a landscape, but instead like you were moving through it, remembering it, feeling it. Much like Mayhew's own experiences visiting plantations, the viewer's personal experiences and cultural background impact how you experience his work. Mayhew does not seek to depict the land realistically, as he is much more interested in the spirituality of the landscape. His landscape paintings, which he calls mindscapes, evoke feelings and emotions through vibrant color and abstracted forms. His work transcends the tangible features of the land to focus on what the land makes him feel. Rooted in Mayhew's reverence for the land and his treatment of the land as sacred for people of color. This panel explores the importance of keeping the land and the environment safe for marginalized groups. The historical violence that Mayhew has acknowledged in his paintings is still continuing. Polluted water and toxic air disproportionately harm communities of color. Alongside reverence for the land, there is knowledge and fear that if action is not taken to address climate change, lives are at risk. On the screen now are just a few examples of current environmental racism concerns throughout the country. Environmental racism is the disproportionate impact of environmental hazards on people of color. The environmental justice movement is the response to said environmental racism. A description that rings true to me and that I often use to kind of describe environmental racism is that Violence done to the environment is violence that is then done to Black and Indigenous bodies and vice versa. From a historical perspective, European Americans altered the landscape for their benefit. Changes to the environment were often achieved through enslaved labor. This is a much more tangible interpretation, linking the intensive cultivation of crops to the harm of enslaved laborers, Indigenous people, and the environment. Environmental racism also occurs when environmental disasters disproportionately impact communities of color, or when the government imposes legislation that places health hazards in communities of color, often through willful neglect. For example, we know that in Louisiana, poor infrastructure left black communities disproportionately impacted by Hurricane Katrina. Another high profile case was the public health crisis in Flint, Michigan where the water in black and brown communities was not drinkable. As shown on these graphics here, Native American tribes throughout the country have been forced onto marginal lands. Those are the lands that are hotter and drier and with fewer mineral resources. The Science Journal states that on average, tribes only have about 2.6% of their ancestral lands left. The loss of land comes from displacements, land theft, and climate change. Long Island also has environmental justice challenges specifically. For the Shinnecock Indian Nation here on Long Island, their 1.5 square mile peninsula is threatened by rising sea levels. While efforts are being made to reduce the harmful impact, a greater scope of action is needed. As reported in the New York Times, Success depends on how quickly the world as a whole stems the rate of sea level rise. Not only is the loss of land a consequence of environmental racism, so is the loss of life. As reported in a recent Newsday article, there is a large discrepancy in life expectancy on Long Island based on where people live. The life expectancy of someone living on Shelter Island, where the demographics are over 90% white, is age 93. However, in North Bellport, where the demographics are much more diverse, the life expectancy is 73. That's a 20 year difference, 20 years more or less of life. In fact, North Bellport, which is also home to the Brookhaven landfill, has the lowest life expectancy on Long Island. This is, however, not to say that all is lost. Richard Mayhew often cites the season of spring as an example of nature's renewal. 
which he compares to the resilience of African American and Native American cultures, saying, they constantly grew and matured and survived. That was my connection to nature. Groups have organized to spread awareness and fight back against environmental injustice. The Brookhaven Landfill Action and Remediation Group, for example, was formed to address environmental injustices in North Belfort and across Long Island more broadly. The Shinnecock Indian Nation has taken measures to slow the land loss impacting their coast. Yet stopping environmental racism requires broader awareness. Presented in conjunction with the Richard Mayhew exhibition, this panel aims to contribute by illuminating environmental justice on Long Island. I'm excited to learn more about this from Dr. Mark Chambers, our first speaker. Oh, thank you, Justice. I really appreciate the introduction and thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, I've been looking forward to this um, night and to talk about environmental justice. Um, but it, uh, a number of you are probably looking at the map here that I have on the screen. And you're thinking, uh, this looks like a map from the 1700s. Uh, uh, actually, I just wanna tell you a story about this map um, and its significance to us thinking about how land is shaped or even reshaped. So like I said, this map is from 1765 and it represents um, how French settlers, when they arrived, uh, how they depicted the Mississippi Valley. And of course they came into the area um, a few decades earlier uh, and maps were being transmitted back to the metropole or back into, uh, um, uh, back over to Europe. Uh, but this map really depicts uh, the Mississippi Valley in 1765. But what I wanna draw your attention to is right in the center of the map. I don't know if you can see my um, mouse or my arrow. Can you see that justice? Or if you need to, uh, yeah. So I don't know, but where it says country full of mines, uh, that was the main mining district uh, and what the, the state that becomes Missouri. And so I just want to draw your attention to that area uh, where that is written. Uh, because this whole idea of country full of mines or this location is noteworthy for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, French would not have known about the lead mines in the Missouri area, and they would have been able to transmit this knowledge back to Europe, or back to France, without Native American environmental knowledge, without Native Americans actually leading them to this, uh, what would become an industrial site. Uh, it's also significant uh, that it would become the primary lead producing area in the United States, uh, but it has its early beginnings in the 1700s, as I mentioned, and really begins to take also takes off uh, in the early American Republic uh, uh, in the uh, uh, in the early part of the uh, of the 19th century, and this really is the beginning of industrialization in this particular area. But with this industrialization that begins in this area of what becomes Missouri, you have European and American settlers as well as African slaves that are in this area. Um, and they're trying to extract the lead out of the ground. Uh, but with lead mining, as you can imagine, came a number of concerns about the environment. So you have individuals that travelers that are coming in, um, natural philosophers or scientists that are coming in, and they're starting to write about and voice their concerns about deforestation as early as the 1790s. Um, settlers also began to observe that their lush and forested landscape was denuded of trees. So in this next image, if you can go to the next image, uh, Justice, thank you. So in this next image here, you see um, after this map uh, and this particular image, are you able to? I am trying, I don't know why it is frozen. You might have to, if you click on the screen, um, maybe it'll move forward. I know that that works for me, so there, there you go. There you go, perfect. So this um, is the, uh, it, it, this is what the landscape would have looked like eventually. And then if you can go to the next image as well, And then if you look closely here down at the bottom of, the, uh, of this image, so this is a sketch from the early 19th century in 1826. And this sketch was completed by a naturalist or an, an artist by the name of Charles uh, Lachure. 
uh, 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 who actually sketched this. And she began to see uh, in the lower part of the screen the denuding of the trees or the cutting down of the forest. And so this is why settlers and also visitors to the area began to get concerned about forest conservation. So this increase in production alerted settlers and also workers to the significant impact on the local landscape, resulting from copious amounts of fuel that was needed to fire the furnaces in order to melt down your lead. Uh, if you can go to the next screen, uh, the next slide. Uh, and this is just, you know, an image of a home, a type of a home that a middle class or upper middle class uh, person would have lived in. This is the Amaro house and it's just outside of St. Genevieve, Missouri. You can go to the next slide. But with mining also, you have more communities that are beginning to grow around the mining district. And with that, you have this concern about protecting your body, but also protecting the bodies of your species, of your cows, your oxes that are helping you to do the work, uh, uh, helping you to cultivate. So because they're living in the vicinity of the furnaces that were emitting harmful and toxic lead fumes. You can go to the next slide. So these slides here are Lamote Village, and then you can go to the uh, or Lamote Mines, which is a major producer of lead, and then you can go to the next one. So um, you can see in this close proximity and these homes to where the mines were actually located, that settlers and workers were also becoming more concerned also about the healthiness or the unhealthiness of the environment. So this sketch here, but also by Charles Lashore, uh, uh, was, and this is another mining area that was started by an American miner by the name of Moses Austin. So you can see he's sketching out this area known as uh, uh, Burton Mines. But on the next slide, it comes a little bit clearer to you. So on the next slide, you'll see a little bit more of a drawing of a close-up of this particular village that was formed uh, in the 1790s. And you can go to the next slide, if you would, please. And then this is what the community would have, uh, was sketched out a little bit clearer by a man by the name of Henry uh, Schoolcraft who visited this area and sketched it out. And he'll publish this uh, in, a, in one of his uh, books on the mining area. And so you can see that it's minor Brenton, but it was also known as Potosi. Uh, but you can see, if you look very closely, not only do you see the lack of trees, but also you do see some smokestacks. And so these would have been the smelters. So if you can imagine, if you're living in close proximity to these, uh, uh, to these smelters, that your body, but also the body of your animals and other species are being affected too. And you can go to the next slide. And so this is with the mining comes industrial, early industrialization, if I can use that term for this period. But also you have the growth, um, the changing of the landscape. You have new towns that are being birthed too. So this is a new town that was called Her that is called Herculaneum. Uh, Herculaneum still exists in Missouri today. Herculaneum was the site of a super fun site um, because of the lead in the area. Uh, and then so what the government actually ended up doing was buying people out so that they could re move them to another place. But if you look in the far end of the uh, of the cliff, you can see what's what was known as a shot tower. And this is where bullets were actually made. And then you go to the next slide, if you would, please. And then this is just a close up of that same town. But then if you look at the far on the hill there, you see this uh, image uh, the stack, if you will. And so this is that once again, that shot tower. So you see how the landscape has changed from that country full of mines image that I showed you the map from 1765. Um, you see that more people are moving into the area. The, the forested area, the lush green area is becoming denuded of trees as well. You can go to the next slide. And then finally, what the what ends up happening, and this is once again Charles Lashore, who who actually sketches this out uh, in 1826. And this is one of his last sketches. And you can see, if you look at this landscape, you see three men here. They're miners. The one man, man in the center is, um, is, is a white man. The two men on this on it that are flanking him are African-American men. And this is, we know this from uh, his narrative. But also what I want to draw your attention to is just how the landscape has completely changed, how it's denuded of trees once again. But also if you look, you see these um, wooden sticks or windlasses and you can see they, you can see them as far as the eye can see all the way up to the horizon, which really gives you a sense of how the landscape had actually changed. So now I would just want to transition from Missouri in the 18th century and then move us into right here in Long Island, uh, almost covering the same period. So you can go to the next slide. 
So Long Island Colonial Period, you'll see, oh, um, uh, back to the previous, that's okay, thanks. Um, the, the colonial era, I have this map here. Uh, I know uh, Jeremy Dennis, who will be speaking after me. Uh, he also has a, a similar map. I actually liked his map a little bit better, but I had already sent these slides off to, uh, to, to Justice. Um, but you really get a sense here of the nativism, the, the native uh, uh, territory that Long Island uh, 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 is, um, but also, you don't get a sense when English settlers come in, but also when African slaves uh, begin to populate um, Long Island as well. And then you can go to the next slide. So, and I just wanted to kind of give a sense of what Long Island may have looked like during this particular period of time. And so one of the closest places that we can actually visit today, and some of you may be familiar with this, is a 20-mile point-to-point Nassau-Suffolk uh, green belt. And so at the northern end of the trail, you could travel and you would find blooming mountain laurel in the summertime. And in the southern, you could find countless species of birds uh, that take seasonal residence in Massapequa Preserve. And so this is, as far as we know from the narratives that were written about the uh, 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 by English settlers, about Long Island, uh, this really hasn't changed that much as far as the type of species uh, that are living there. Uh, you can go to the next slide. And then so with this 20 mile point to point um, uh, reserve here, you'll see that and uh, uh, that it kind of gives you an idea that it stretches from the southern point all the way up to the northern point. The next slide, the next few slides kind of walks through the trail. You'll see that I just wanted to point out Levittown here because we know that after World War II, we really begin to see the landscape of Long Island changing significantly, where it changes from being a farmland, uh, these open spaces, to with national prosperity, making more uh, uh, families having access to car ownership, and then the construction of new suburban neighborhoods. So really, you almost see the erasuring of, um, of Native American lands or Native American practices. And then, of course, you have the English settlers, you have American settlers that come into the area. And then as we move into the, uh, into the 1940s, 1945, suburban neighborhoods of single-family homes in Levittown, uh, as, as, as Americans or New Yorkers are in search of more pastoral settings for themselves but also for their children too. So you can go to the next slide. And so, and, the, and the, with this slide, you can really get a sense of with the arrows, and this is how you can actually do this walk today. Uh, some of you may be familiar if you've gone down the Beth Page State Parkway, if you look over to the east, I guess it would be the east side, yeah, the east side of the parkway, you can actually see the trail there, which is uh, pavement as well. And then the next slide. And then so this is, you know, Oyster Bay on the northern uh, area that I mentioned of the trail where you have blooming mountain laurel in the summertime. Uh, but also I just have these images, uh, 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 compliments of a friend of mine, Chris Sellers, and uh, of the northern part of Long Island, but also the trail itself. Uh, the next slide, please. And so once again, you have these arrows and, uh, you know, that you can actually walk this uh, today. And I believe it probably takes around eight hours uh, to walk it um, uh, uh, from the South Shore to the North Shore or vice versa. Uh, the next slide, please. So what is the spread? You know, there's these suburbs that are emerging. We see the erasure of trails like this or community lands like you saw of landscapes like this. So this is from Google Images. Uh, we begin to see the sub of, uh, the spread of suburbs meant building over thousands of acres of farmland. The next slide. And then simultaneously, uh, uh, you begin to, it, this image shows how from 1944 to 1947 to 1967, how suburbanizing changed the forest cover. So very similar to what I showed you, what was happening in Missouri from the 18th century into the early 19th century, how, uh, uh, how lead mining, how industrialization actually changed the forest cover in that particular area as well. Uh, the next slide. And then also the next slide too. Uh, so this is to give you, you a sense of, you know, the highest valued houses in 1980 compared to forest patches and the highest valued housing in 2010 compared to forest patches as well. So you can see, uh, uh, depending on the price of your home, where you have the most forested lands. Uh, the next slide, please. 
And then of course, with World War II, Levittown, the suburbs, simultaneously have the growth of the chemical industry, the rapid introduction of synthetic uh, chemicals, had safety limit testing, and uh, uh, had limited safety uh, 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 testing, it led to accumulation of many pollutants affecting the environment and also human bodies. The next slide, the impacts of pollution uh, uh, were felt strongly by working class um, uh, Americans who could, who could face chemical exposures not only in their backyards, but also in their workplaces. And of course, this will lead to Rachel Carson's book, The Silent Spring in 1962. And she's and one quote from her is, as crude as a weapon as the caveman's club, the chemical barrage has been hurled against the fabric of life. A fabric of a fabric on the one hand delicate and destructible, and on the other miraculously tough and resilient, capable of striking back in unexpected ways. All this has come about because of the sudden rise of prodigious growth of an industry for the production of man made or synthetic chemicals with insecticide properties. The next slide. So this, you know, normally when we think about the spread of these chemicals and this industrialization, we think of the United States, but this is happening all around the world, right? Uh, uh, the spread of industrialization is happening worldwide. And then this will come to a halt. Then really uh, uh, in 1962, uh, uh, with the presence of, uh, uh, of Rachel Carson and her book, Silent Spring, we be begin to see this lead up to the EPA being established in 1970, as more than uh, hundreds of millions of people are being affected by this industrialization. The modern an environmental movement will overlap. And this drew support from high school students like you see here, college students and others during uh, uh, following the political turmoil of the 1950s and 1960s. Um, the movement attracted major support from middle and upper class uh, 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 classes as well, coalitions of working groups and a variety of interest groups, uh, people that were interested in outdoor lands, wet, wide lands and open spaces were concerned too. So this particular images um, from high school students from Los Angeles. But we know that high school students in Santiago, Chile, Tokyo, Los Angeles, were also suffering from the effects of air pollution as they were in LA and also here in New York and across the United States, but also across the world. And so with this first Earth Day on August 22nd of 1970, the same year that the EPA is established and signed into law by Richard Nixon, many Americans participate in protests and teachings and also volunteer activities uh, as well. Well, uh, if you go to the next slide, and to bring it back to Long Island, this is actually a clip from a newspaper from the Farmingdale Observer uh, of the first Earth Day. And it was published in a front page article along with a page of photographs of volunteers that you see here. And once again, this is April 22nd of 1970, the first Earth Day. The article discussed the Earth Day activities on Long Island, such as students cleaning up local ponds, writing to state legislators, uh, uh, and numerous assemblies of high, in high school. Uh, and student teachings for adults on ecology and also on pollution uh, too. The next slide. But as you look at those images, you know, we really get a sense that the environmental movement was a white movement. Um, and remember, it came in on the, on the heels of the civil rights movement of the, 19, of the 1960s. And if you go to the next slide, um, but we also see that on that same Earth Day in Los Angeles, you had black students that were protesting too. So we can ask the question, was this the beginning of the environmental justice movement uh, in LA in 1970? Or was it in Houston in 1979? Or was it with Lois Gibbs in upstate New York, right? Um, or was it in Warren County in, 19, in 1982? So the environmental justice movement appears as a grassroots movement, just like the civil rights movement in 1970 and 1980s, and it opened the door to force Americans to examine how low-income people of color facing environmental threats from hazardous waste and other toxin materials were affected. Uh, you can go to the uh, next slide. Most of the leaders of the original movement were women. You had civil rights leaders like Cora Tucker. You had Lois Marie Gibbs, um, who, uh, uh, who founded Citizens Clearinghouse for Hazardous Waste. You had Sue Gear in Indiana, who also founded another organization against hazardous waste landfill sites. The issue, as we move into the late 1970s and 1980s, moves from planting gardens, from cleaning out ponds, from monitoring the water. It moves to the issue of toxic 
it and has it industrial waste. And this is what Justice was talking about before in her presentation as well. And so this has been arguably the most dynamic environmental issue and it continues to today. So by 1988, uh, we have around 4,700 local groups uh, that oppose toxic waste. In the 1980s, you have a well-networked social movement uh, that was on the rise. So this is also the beginning of the uh, environmental justice movement. Can you uh, go to the next slide? Uh, and then the next slide as well. And so here on Long Island, people are concerned about toxins getting into their, uh, into their water system uh, um, uh, as water seeps into the ground. So water, groundwater threats, as the slide says, by income level it shows, but most of these Superfund sites contain waste dumps between 1945 and 1970. The next slide, if you would, please. And then, of course, we come to the present day, and one of the main issues in the present day are uh, the PFAs, uh, if you will, the Long Island's toxic forever chemicals. And so this is an issue that is very prevalent today. And in fact, a number of months ago, um, a number of scholars and also activist panelists got together uh, and, and, and did a Zoom uh, panel uh, on these PFAs or the pearl, uh, the polyfluorocarbon substances uh, are a class of thousands of chemicals that are widely used in consumer products. And this is also an environmental justice issue today here on Long Island to the point where as we're sitting here today um, in our Zoom rooms, uh, connected to the Heckscher Museum, there's an international summit on plastic pollution taking place at Long Island University on the Brooklyn campus as well, uh, in person and also on Zoom too, today and also tomorrow. So, um, I just wanted to give us a sense of not only you know this industrial change that are happening in the Midwest. Uh, but also how it happens here on Long Island as well, and how this changes the landscape and causes the rise in environmental justice here too. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Chambers. That was incredibly insightful. I know I have questions based off of your presentation. Um, up next is Jeremy Dennis and I talked, I touched upon very briefly about indigeneity and um, kind of the overconsumption of land. So I'm excited to hear more about what he says. Jeremy, I don't know if I can hear you. Oh, uh, sorry about that. <laughs> there we go. Um, thank you, Justice, for that wonderful introduction and um, Dr. Chambers for that awesome presentation. I learned so much. Um, and hello, everyone. My name is Jeremy Dennis. I'm from the Shinnecock Indian Nation out in Southampton, New York. I want to focus a little bit on the indigenous um, sort of um, specific perspective on environmental justice and issues that we've faced historically and um, con in contemporary times. And so I do want to start with a map as well. This is the 13 original um, uh, tribal communities throughout Long Island, New York, um, illustrated by David Bun Martin. And I always like to start with these, even though um, there's always that introduction and a land acknowledgement, because it's always important to acknowledge whose land you're on, and also um, that everything is possible thanks to the land. And so if you are able to give, um, it is uh, important to um, do that gesture. And so uh, for us here at Shinnecock, you can see our territory on the east um, edge of this uh, map. Um, even though we only retain about a fraction of our traditional land, the land really means everything to us. It's where we came from, it's where we belong, and it's what is home. And so the environmental protection is um, such an important topic for us. And so before jumping into that, I just want to give a little bit of context and background around Shinnecock. This is a photo I took of our community center right in the heart of the nation. Um, a common question we often get is how many Shinnecock people live on this very small land? There's about 600 of us who live on the territory, whereas there's about 1,800 of us who are enrolled in throughout the world. This land is only one mile north to south, about 800 square acres. And I like to tell people that um, we've been here for more than 10,000 years. And so the environment is central to our identity, to our survival, 
and to hopefully uh, double and continue that legacy. Um, we are the only federally recognized tribe from the original 13. And so that means that we have a huge stake in terms of our um, sovereignty and to protect the land from Brooklyn to Montauk. Um, back in 2010, we received our federal recognition after more than 30 years of petitioning. And so what this essentially means is that we now have a government to government relationship with the United States. And that also means that we now um, sort of um, consult or steward a lot of the land on Long Island and try to protect it as part of our um, identity. I want to share our tribal seal and our flag as well, just because there's so many um, environmental symbols on the seal from the Atlantic right whale at the bottom, us on the water on the uh, center uh, southern part, uh, us canoeing along with our sacred thunderbird, the deer on the right, and of course the um, indigenous box turtle in the center. Um, throughout my presentation, I'll focus on Shinnecock's connection to the environment through the lens of environmental injustice we've endured um, as it relates to the theft of our land and the inaccessibility of our, um, our, of our, our resources that we've thrived upon for thousands of years before colonization. And so this is one of our most important maps. It um, represents our land before 1859, which includes Sabonic, um, Shinnecock Hills, much of present day Southampton town. And I put a little um, green, green rectangle around the present day um, Shinnecock reservation. And so just as a brief history, um, in 1859, this land in the darker tone was stolen from Shinnecock through deceit, through um, uh, forged signatures and other means as a way of um, both taking our land from us in huge mass um, to prepare for the uh, Long Island Railroad. And so for decades, Shinnecock has been battling to regain this land. And it's really um, us getting federal recognition to um, try to begin that process. And so um, within this uh, sacred landscape called the Shinnecock Hills, um, one of our most important sacred sites is known as Sugarloaf Hill today. And um, just a brief history of that site in um, 1989, Southampton Town allowed a private developer to desecrate the site by building a private residence. And it wasn't until 30 years later in 2021 that we worked with uh, Peconic Land Trust that you see on the screen to uh, preserve that site to destroy the house that's built upon our ancestral burial grounds that have been used from 3,000 years ago and to try to retain it for its um, natural qualities as well and heritage. And so um, because of this um, mission, we're able to uh, protect the environment, but also protect our um, cultural and sacred resources. And so going to the present day reservation, this is a satellite image of Shinnecock. We're surrounded by water on three sides and very close to the Atlantic Ocean in Southampton. And so for us, we've always had a history with the water. And so access to water and the quality of the water has always been important to us. And so for that um, thousands of years of time, we have also needed to have access to water because of our uh, traditional practice of taking the quahog shell on the left and turning it into wampum beads on the right through a, a delicate process. Um, here's a, a contemporary artist, uh, Tecumseh Caesar, um, doing his rendition of wampum beadwork. And so I took this photo of a landscape on the southern tip of the Shinnecock Reservation called The Point. This is a communal uh, resource for fishing, um, seasonal hunting. Uh, many generations of um, Shinnecock parents have taught their children how to um, harvest, um, hunt geese, um, duck. Um, it's also home of millions of oysters and clams. And so it's um, relatively easy to go here and harvest year round, but it is a very small um, body of uh, land. And so if you um, are familiar with the Hamptons, you can kind of see the difference between the way that we steward the land in the Hamptons on the left, where it's mostly um, pretty much a nature reserve and if you squint or zoom in your screen, you can see the mansions across the water, which uh, separates us. And so even before um, 
or I, I should say before colonization, um, Shinnecock people had this strong connection with the water due to the uh, indigenous Atlantic right whale, which lived in our waters uh, between seasons. Um, it entered into our bays. They sometimes beached themselves. Um, Shinnecock people would use the whale as a resource. Um, it was also part of our um, identity. We used the whale in our ceremonies as part of our gifts, as part of our um, sort of everyday life. And so by the um, 1650s, uh, 10 years after European um, English uh, started to colonize the area, um, the whaling industry began on Eastern Long Island. And so um, somewhat reluctantly, indigenous people began to enter the cruise because this was one way, uh, pretty much the only way that you can make a living at this point. Um, even 10 years after colonization, so much of the land was being um, signed away or taken, and we were restricted to smaller and smaller, smaller parts of land in addition to our um, trade being restricted. And so this was one opportunity where um, Indian men could actually make a living, um, stay in the, uh, in the local um, homelands, and also um, kind of make good, good relations. And so the whaling industry was very profitable during this time because lanterns were um, lit by the whale oil. And so a lot of the manufacturing was actually um, taken from this region and brought back to Europe for um, sales and profit. But by the, um, uh, from 17th century um, onward, the whaling population dropped uh, dramatically towards the point of extinction. And even though there's no huge whaling industry today in this region, um, there's less than 400 white whale, uh, right uh, whales in the world. And so even though um, this is part of a bygone era, um, there's still whales being killed unnecessarily through shipping lanes. And so for us here at Shinnecock, this is part of our identity being threatened and lost. Um, even though Shinnecock no longer um, whales, we do have an environmental department that was mentioned in Justice's um, introduction. And so this is Siobhan Smith, who's the director of the Shinnecock Environmental Department. Um, I believe she was featured in 2020. And so part of um, Siobhan's work and the environmental department's work is to restore Shinnecock's coastline. Um, back in the um, early to mid 20th century, due to climate change, an inlet was uh, formed between our freshwater Shinnecock Bay and the Atlantic Ocean. And so this was um, really harmful to our way of life and our survival because of the um, obvious of turning freshwater into salt and no longer having those resources, um, no longer being able to sustain ourselves through local resources. And so um, part of the work that the Shinnecock environment does today is to try to undo this new um, sort of a strong current that this inlet provides. So no longer does Shinnecock Bay just have calm um, coastlines and small waves. Um, if there's big storms, the western coast of Shinnecock's uh, reservation gets hammered by these um, storm waves. And so you can see in this photo, they're planting eelgrass. And in recent years, they've introduced these boulders and tons of sand to try to undo some of this climate change um, damage. Um, historically, if we look at the water um, work of Shinnecock, um, we had the Shinnecock um, Oyster Project, which, which started in the 1970s. Um, but it wasn't too long um, by 1980 and the 90s that the project was discontinued because of the, um, in some cases, over-harvesting um, sometimes there was introduction of disease among the oyster population. Um, sometimes there were um, brown algae tides. Um, even today, there's different issues with the water quality from too much nitrogen or too much or too little um, oxygen in the water, which causes um, stunted maturity or um, huge die-offs in our waters and bays. And so today, um, even though the oyster project is no longer in its former state, we have a new group called the Shinnecock Kelp Farmers, which is led by uh, six Shinnecock women who grow in indigenous kelp. And just like the oysters, the kelp is put into the water to reduce the nitrogen that's been introduced. 
Um, in addition to that, um, in 2019, um, Shinnecock tribe members were um, brought to court over harvesting in our local bays. And so this is one of the envir environmental racism um, cases or examples um, for Shinnecock and many other indigenous nations in this country. Um, we never signed away our rights to um, access our resources. Um, we still retain and practice those rights. And so um, we have had historically many um, issues with Southampton Town in terms of simply using um, resources that we've been using for thousands of years. In addition to that, um, we live in one of the most beautiful um, areas of the world in terms of beach access, um, our local town beaches, Cooper's Beach in Southampton. And so I wanted to include this slide because um, we have a tribal member, Diani Brown, who brought up the case that, um, well, for thousands of years, we've been able to access our beaches. We've been able to harvest our wampum and um, just have that right to practice our canoeing. But in recent years, um, Southampton Town has enacted a $40 a day pass to park here or a seasonal pass. And the um, thing that is sort of a slap to us is the fact that um, if you live in Southampton and you're a full-time resident, you don't have to pay this, but um, Shinnecock people are treated like outsiders to their own um, beach access. And so we would have to pay. And so in addition to maintaining our, our rights to these local beaches, um, we find that this, uh, this is an attack on our um, way of life, our ability to access these natural resources and cultural practices. And so um, for us at Shinnecock before colonization, it was traditional that um, shells were gathered during summer seasons and manufactured into beads on the right um, during the harsh uh, winter um, colds. And so um, this is part of um, something that everyone takes part in traditionally. And so to um, not have this access is something that we're working on today. Um, I think younger uh, generations of Shinnecock people are really putting themselves out there in terms of getting higher education and studying law to try to really um, make the point clear that we do have these rights. We can defend ourselves if they do bring us to court that we can actually defend our rights. And so this is Dr. Kelsey Leonard from Shinnecock. Um, this is a photo from her website, but she's a um, water scientist. Um, she's a scholar in um, legal um, access to water policy expert and a writer as well. And so she's part of the um, up and coming generations of Shinnecock people trying to retain our rights to this um, access. And in addition to that, in more recent years, um, Shinnecock people have also participated in local and international um, canoe journeys as part of the, um, well, part of our thousand year tradition, but to also create awareness around environmental uh, community needs. And so for uh, Shinnecock canoers, uh, this, these different journeys are about protecting our water rights, which were taken as early as um, 1636 in terms of um, if you want to talk about privatization of land or territories or the fact that we were no longer able to harvest different fish or natural materials. And <clears throat> excuse me. So the canoe journeys are not only about that, but it's also about reconnecting with the water and spreading um, just a simple um, change in life for some individuals around sobriety um, and substance abuse prevention, um, because these are really about building community in times where we've been torn away from accessing these sites. And so um, this is another photo of Shanae Bullock, one of um, the Shinnecock community um, tribal members. Um, I interviewed her back in 2018 about her um, supporting the um, Standing Rock tribe and attending the Dakota Access Pipeline protest back in 2016. And so for us, it's such an important topic that um, not only did Shanae go and participate, but um, at least a dozen Shinnecock people went across the country um, they drove across country to support um, water rights, protecting water and stating that um, water is life. 
Um, one of the interesting things that have developed in recent years with the, especially the um, conflicts with Russia, but also just the transition from fossil fuels into renewable energies is the fact that um, we want to um, both harness the power of the sun and the power of the wind and try to um, reduce um, carbon in emissions. But an interesting thing for indigenous people who have been here for thousands of years is that um, even though when windmills are popular in Europe and coming to the US, um, we're trying to push them more and more offshore so that um, really um, wealthy individuals, especially those in the Hamptons, um, can retain the value of their homes so that they really don't have to see these in their backyards or in their view at all. And so um, these are sometimes built um, 16 miles off the coastline into the ocean. But for us at Shinnecock and other indigenous communities, um, if you think back to that time, these were actually the um, coastlines of the land back then before the uh, sea rose. And so these are part of our thousand year history of material culture or sacred sites. And they also impact the migration of our Atlantic right whales. So in addition to their population still recovering and still being affected by shipping, um, these are also being built in areas that um, they call their habitat and their home and part of our identity. Um, I also saw this slide yesterday on CNN. Um, even though we're such a water-based people um, on land, we also practice the controlled burning of our territory each fall um, immediately after the harvest season to uh, clear the forest, um, to con control the undergrowth for hunters and to control ticks. And they also help to control the invasive species in our, in our environment, in addition to improving the watershed conditions and reducing uh, tree comp uh, competition for water and nutrients. And so this is something that as early as the um, earliest, earliest um, 20th century, we continue to practice. And there's photos of our territory being almost flat, seeing from entrance to the edge of the water, um, how flat it was. But I think that in recent times, we've been told, um, well, not only us at Shinnecock, but other tribes have been told, like, we don't know the best ways to control or um, have that sort of harmony with nature. We need to adopt the ways of our outsiders. So I thought that this was a really um, relevant um, news story. And so a lot of the um, information and research from this presentation comes from a personal project called On the Site Indigenous Long Island. And so I popped a um, link at the bottom, but this is a resource that's free to access and it contains Long Island's um, indigenous site-specific histories along with different sites of natural resources. And it really, um, in a sense, just pushes our um, belonging and sense of um, what is home for Shinnecock people beyond the present day reservation, which is only one mile north to south. And so these are all the different sites that I know of so far and still have to go out and photograph. Um, another environmental injustice I wanted in, in injustice I wanted to mention was something called um, Terra Nutul, um, uh, Nulis, which represents a, a concept of land theft. And so um, I, it is my personal belief that people were conscious, people wanted to do the right thing. But um, when colonists first came to the Americas, they, they in their mind or their understanding believed that the land was all sort of um, this tabula rasa, it was being underutilized. And so they used that as an excuse to um, seize our land. But for us, we were going from site to site between seasons. We were avoiding exhausting different natural resources. Um, we were cultivating plants that were foreign to them and therefore looked like wild plant life. And so um, these are just different ways that um, the land seizure was justified. And um, those who knew, um, knew that they were doing the wrong thing and everyone else kind of was in the um, background. But today, um, these are just a couple of different photos I took from off, uh, online, but they represent that same history of um, vacant storefronts all throughout Southampton, our neighboring town, and us at Shinnecock having to live here, live here all year round 
And these are storefronts that are empty for three seasons out of the year. And many of them are standing on stolen land. And so this is just part of our um, environmental injustice issues that we're trying to undo. And so um, these are just different ways to contact or if you wanna learn more about the on the site project, but um, maybe I'll stop sharing and um, thank you all for listening. Great, thank you so much, Jeremy. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, I'm now inviting people to drop in their questions in either the chat or the question and answer box. And we have, a, we have some time for a few questions. So while I guess we wait for people to drop in those questions, I think something that a lot of people are wondering is a lot of these issues seem systemic. They seem greater than the individual. So what can the individual person do to help combat environmental racism? Um, and that can go towards either of you because I know that's something that I am thinking about constantly. Yeah, I'll start, um, give Jeremy a little break there. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy, that was really great. I really learned a lot, it was wonderful. Um, yeah, so I, what, you know, because it is since, systemic um, environmental racism. I think that one of the things that uh, we can just be aware of is the organizations that we can join and uh, work with, um, such as the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance uh, is one, um, or even the Environmental Justice Work Group, uh, which is right here on Long Island. They study Long Island Sound. Um, and so I think that that is one way uh, or a couple of ways really is in, in becoming aware of these issues is to join uh, a group or join a community group. Um, and sometimes I know like during uh, on you know, Martin Luther King Day in January when there are marches, there's also um, events where they, people don't only come together in the community to celebrate Martin Luther King's life, but they also come together around these issues of environmental justice as well. Great, thank you so much. Um, I was gonna add in, in uh, another group that you could join that's local. I see um, Ryan Madden in the um, group here. <laughs> um, he's part of the Long Island Progressive Coalition. Um, they're also um, associated with the Landfill um, Initiative in Brookhaven. But I think that just showing up and being active and um, I, I think in some cases or maybe a lack of other words, just being disruptors and just showing people like, this is important. Um, we as individuals can make change. Um, I think that is an important message, but living in the Hamptons, um, thinking about like, what can individual people do? I think especially in Suffolk County and New York State, um, so much is actually left to the individual in terms of consumption, in terms of overdevelopment, the choice is really theirs. So it's um, in, in many cases, it's just the fact that people can do something, so they end up doing it. And so I'm, I'm a big fan of that model that um, I think we, we can do this as humanity, trying to preserve more land, getting to maybe in the future a point where maybe 50% of the um, planet is just left to nature and left to um, sustaining humanity as part of that environment. And so um, the Hamptons is just a good example of overconsumption, just like I, I, I live here and I can walk down to the water and identify almost every house in view being vacant, just being there to sit there and gain value. And um, I think this is just part of the problem that um, is part of bigger systems in, in our country and um, globally. Great, thank you so much. Uh, this is a question that I think many people, or many people, but both of you could answer. Um, are there generational differences in Black and Indigenous communities and how they approach this issue? I think that's something that, um, Mark, you definitely kind of hinted at in your in your presentation. So I'll throw the ball to you first. Yeah, um, yeah, I just, uh, thank you. I just uh, uh, saw that question. I, um, right away, to be honest with you, what came to mind is the civil rights movement and how different generations approached uh, the civil rights movement. Um, it, it, 
you know, at times it seemed like it was multi-generational. But what I mean by that is that also within uh, the older generation, there were members of the older generation that didn't feel that the, civil, the way the civil rights movement was being carried out was the correct way to do things, right? Um, and so, whereas uh, we begin to see in the civil rights movement um, that divide, but then also as some progress is being made in the movement, you also begin to see young people start to stand up and say, well, you know, we don't want to be part of this particular, we don't want to be part of the NAACP. We don't want to be part of the uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. We want to form our own group, such as, excuse me, we, we want to form the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, and be more in your face, be more present, as Jeremy said, um, and, and also thinking about ways to make change come very, uh, uh, more quicker, too. So I think that that's one of the generational things that we even see uh, today as well. Another question in the chat. This is from my, my graduate advisor, Catherine Dan Rober. She asked a very good question and something that I was thinking about when creating this panel. Um, in what other ways might you find useful in partnering with cultural heritage institutions like art museums? Because that, I mean, I don't know, it's one of those things where environmental racism and environmental concerns impact everyone, institutions in general. So I'm wondering if either of you two have any insights. Um, well, I think yeah, tonight's a great example. Um, like I work in the field of arts. I never, well, I have to admit, I might have never attended um, Dr. Chambers lectures, but I feel like this is something that's part of our existential <laughs> uh, concerns. It's just something that, like, do we really want to drink toxic water? Do we really want to pass this world and the trajectory to the next generation? And so I think that um, museums, just the venue that they have, just the space that they hold, um, offers this type of conversation, these different lectures and knowledge sharing opportunities. Um, maybe have um, a different perspective, Dr. Chambers. Um, I think something that I've been contemplating as well is that people tend to like want their names attached to things and they tend to want to center themselves. So I think while it is important to make sure that what you're doing with environmental justice is in line with your organization's mission statement, it's also important that like at the end of the day, like, yes, it's great that artists are concerned about this, but also people are dying. So I think just kind of making sure that while you're like running with it and it makes sense for what your institution prioritizes, you're also being very understanding that there are grave consequences. So to not water that down. So I think panels and intellectual conversations are very helpful, but I definitely think working with the communities directly is probably the most important because I think it no longer centers the institution, which tends to be white, it tends to be in hierarchical and it helps to focus on the people who are disproportionately impacted. I don't know if that helps, but. Um, I think that, I, that does. I'm glad, Justice, that you mentioned that. Um, you know, um, today I was in a, or earlier today, uh, in one of our sessions with the program that I'm uh, working with, it was talking about just that. Um, I mean, Jeremy used the word present, but also just as you just said, being in the community. And this whole, you know, civil rights movement, a grassroots movement, right? Black power movement, a grassroots movement, the environmental justice movement, a grassroots movement, you know, that started from the bottom up. And so, so that we don't have that disconnect um, to bring more collaboration. Uh, but I, I'm tending to think that that collaboration really needs to start in the communities because the communities, they, and we hear this from environmental justice activists constantly. We, I, I just heard it say from a woman that um, is an activist in, in Ohio. She said, we know our communities. We know what we need. We know what the problems are. Come and talk to us, you know? So, uh, yeah, so but anyway, I'm sorry. I got a little passionate about that when you said communities. I think that that's really very powerful and very important today. Thank you. I mean, I'm glad you're passionate about it. This is this is a type of topic where it's very easy to get passionate about because it is so important. 
Okay, wow. Yes, people are really enjoying this panel. There are a lot of questions. So I think we have time for one, maybe two more questions, and then we will call it a night. Um, so someone wanted to know, Jeremy, if you would be willing to talk more about your on this site project and how it came to be and how you're building it. People are really fascinated by it. And honestly, so am I. Um, oh, sure. Thank you, Anne, for that question. The um, project was made possible by a nonprofit called Running Strong for American Indian Youth. They um, fund different Native um, youth-led projects. And so just growing up in my area, um, you might learn about Thanksgiving. You might, if you're lucky, learn about the Wampanoag in school curriculum. And so by the time I was 25 or 26, I really um, acknowledged that lack of understanding just where I come from and my ancestral history. And so with this um, grant, I proposed using my skills as a photographer to gather a lot of this information and make it easily accessible online. And so there is a lot of firsthand um, like primary resource material on, um, in books. But if you Googled Shinnecock uh, when I started in 2016, it would bring you up to Wikipedia, maybe a paragraph with different links to outside resources. And so um, what I'm trying to do is just fill the void of knowledge and understanding. And so there's a lot of um, kind of themes in this presentation alone about um, cultural erasure and trying to er erase indigenous people. And so this is just a simple project of taking info that's collecting dust on library shelves and just trying to bring it to wider audiences and trying to just appreciate um, some of our shared history. And so it's an ongoing project. I probably just scratched the surface of 2% of what, what I have collected over the years, but um, I just really enjoy learning and sharing at that same time. Great, thank you so much. So there is one question that I had that I definitely wanted to ask because a lot of these issues tend to be very interrelated. So I wanted to speak on, and I think this hints at what Jeremy was speaking about, about cultural erasure and how that relates to environmental racism. What other social justice or social concerns do you see connecting to environmental racism? I'm thinking of the housing crisis in particular is something that comes to my mind, but I wanted to know if there were any others that you were thinking of as well. If you don't mind, I'll go uh, first. I, I just, uh, one that I was thinking about is the whole issue of climate justice as well uh, and climate change. Um, you know, it's really no secret that a lot of our cities uh, in the United States, um, despite decades of outlawed housing discrimination in low income neighborhoods, clustered in the cities that they're still very segregated. Um, and many of these neighborhoods suffer from what's known as the heat island effect, uh, where people of color, um, don't have, you know, the, excuse me, where darker colored materials are used on construction roads and buildings and don't allow heat to escape at the same levels as less industrial materials or in less industrial areas too, um, such as soil and grass, making overall temperatures higher. Um, so uh, I, I think that that is also connecting, you know, when we think about environmental justice, environmental racism, that we also need to think about climate justice too. Uh, and, um, and, 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 and the disproportionate way that uh, Black, Indigenous, and uh, people of color communities are affected, will be affected. Um, you know, we saw this affect what happened with Hurricane Sandy, too, um, a few years ago. So I think that um, environmental racism, climate justice are connected and interrelated with one another. Um. I was gonna just add to um, Dr. Chambers' response because um, on a hyper-specific scale, well, I guess it uh, applies to Shinnecock, but other indigenous nations that are based on coastlines affected by climate change. One of the um, really horrible things that we have to deal with um, if you are an individual or a family is the fact that you can't get um, any insurance, like nationwide insurance of any kind. And if you can get it, it's probably I'm gonna say like 10 times more expensive at least um, to pay for. And so most of these houses um, are uninsured. And so um, to me, in, in my mind, the climate change issue is just a matter of time, especially with our um, way of approaching it. And so if you combine the fact that you can't get insurance for 
um, your house being damaged or destroyed during these storms or floods. Um, the other issue is that um, because of that threat to our structures, um, we because of our land title and um, what what is Indian land or Aboriginal territory, if it gets destroyed, you can't get loans to rebuild um, because if you default on your loans or get a mortgage and you can't repay it, banks can't take back that money or take back the um, land. So um, you can't be eligible for that either. So it's almost as if like the way that people are approaching this and trying to help Indigenous people is just um, <laughs> just waiting for us to disappear in so many different ways. It's a, a very subtle thing, but um, it's something that we all think about. It's something that like it, it's worth it for us to spend so much money on bringing the sand in and these boulders because this is so much of what we have and what we have left. Um, I, I always tell people that um, we, we've endured 300 plus years of colonization and forced assimilation in boarding schools. And so our, our culture was stolen from us, but I, I always say that our land can bring those things back to us. So if we finally lose our land, it's something that is um, sort of uh, soul crushing. Thank you guys so much for this. I, you both have brought, I, my page is full of notes and things that I'm going to research later. I'm sure so many others that came here feel the same way. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for organizing this. Uh, nice to meet you, Jeremy. I hope to work with you again. This was very nice. Likewise. Thank you both. Thank you, Caitlin, for all your... Thank technical you. Technical Thank you expertise. all. Appreciate it. We appreciate your expertise and everything you've shared with us this evening. Um, thank you to our viewers for attending. We really appreciate you giving your time to learn about this really important topic. Um, as a reminder to everyone attending, if you'd like to view works of art by Richard Mayhew, you can visit the exhibition Richard Mayhew Reinventing Landscape at the Heckscher Museum on view until April 24th. Jeremy Dennis's artwork, The Moon Person Ascends, is also currently on view as part of another exhibition, Moonstruck Lunar Art from the Collection, which is on view until September 18th. So please come visit us. Check out our website at heckscher.org for more information or to schedule your visit. And be well. Thank you, everyone.